Let's give you one or, one or two more minutes and then we'll get going. All right. Okay, let's get this party started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our AQT Colloquium for April. Uh, today, I'm very happy to introduce Sh Shyam Shankar. He received his bachelor's in electrical engineering from the in Indian Institute of Technology, and then his PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton University in 2010. Then he went on for a number of years to be a, a postdoc and in a research scientist, Yale University Applied Physics Department, where he worked on a lot of the early pioneering work on superconducting quantum computing and also on quantum limited amplifiers and non-reciprocal devices. And since 2019, he has been a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, working on similar type of research. Uh, we're very happy to have him, and he's going to talk to us about Josephson paramps for rapid high fidelity measurement of solid state qubits. Take it away, Shem. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, does everything look okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, great. Let me just do one thing. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, some work that uh, we have been doing uh, now for a number of years uh, on uh, building Josephson parametric amplifiers for the measurement of uh, solid state qubits and in particular superconducting qubits. Uh, this is of course a very mature field now and in fact Irfan was one of the pioneers in this field. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that many of you also perhaps are even using paramps in your sort of day-to-day -day quantum measurements that you might be doing. Uh, so. Uh, in this talk, my goal is sort of to give you a sense of uh, what is involved in the design of these amplifiers and sort of convey uh, some of the still interesting engineering challenges that we can we can sort of uh, overcome here. Okay, uh, and I guess I should just mention, feel free to uh, stop me at any time during the talk and ask any questions. Uh, there's not an issue. All right, uh, so uh, before I begin, I should just acknowledge all the colleagues who are involved in this work. Uh, so in the first third or so of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about some work that I led back while I was at Yale uh, in the group of Michelle Devere along with these colleagues. Uh, and then as uh, David said, uh, I have since moved to UT Austin and in the latter part of the talk, I'll tell you about work that my graduate students, Ethan and Theo are doing. And some of this work is in collaboration with the group of Jawad Shabani at uh, NYU. All right, so here's a broad, uh, a brief outline. Uh, I'll just describe uh, for you a motivation for building these JPAs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but in case there are any beginners in the audience. Uh, and then I will describe uh, a specific type of JPA that we call a snail parametric amplifier. And I'll describe how we can optimize this type of amplifier for compression power, uh, which is important when you wanna use these amplifiers to read out signals coming from many, many qubits in a large scale quantum processor. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll tell you about some ongoing work we're doing where we're realizing these paramps now with a different type of uh, uh, Josephson junction, uh, one that is uh, realized using an aluminum indium arsenide uh, super semi heterostructure. Okay, uh, so just uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are 
uh, aware of this uh, in our sort of circuit QED architecture for superconducting qubits, the measurement of the qubit is basically done by sending microwave drives to the microwave resonator that's coupled to the qubit and looking at, for instance, a transmitted response. Uh, the qubit essentially shifts the frequency of the resonator by some frequency that we call the dispersive shift chi. Uh, and this is typically comparable to the line width of the resonator kappa, such that essentially if we drive right at the center of these two frequencies, we can get one of two possible phase shifts to the transmitted signal, right? And so this is how we essentially do our qubit readout. We, we associate the phase of uh, the signal, uh, uh, one phase with the ground state and the other phase with the excited state. We measure that phase and so we know what this uh, qubit state is. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at how, what really controls the fidelity of these type of uh, circuit QED readout. Uh, we can understand that by imagining you have a readout pulse that's sent to your microwave resonator. Uh, we represent that as a coherent state in the IQ plane uh, with this ket alpha. Uh, and when the pulse transmits through the resonator, uh, depending on the qubit state, it picks up one of two possible phases. Either it rotates to the left or it rotates to the right, corresponding to the ground state or the excited state. And if these distributions are well enough separated as compared to their uh, noise, uh, as compared to the sort of the standard deviation of these Gaussians, then you can essentially draw a threshold right at the middle uh, and you can associate outcomes which occur on the left of the threshold with the ground state and outcomes on the right of the threshold with the excited state. And so essentially this becomes a quantum, so-called quantum non-devolution measurement of the sigma Z operator of our qubit. All right, so then the question about the fidelity of this readout uh, is basically boils down to how well can we discriminate these two qubit states? And uh, it really depends on one crucial factor that controls the fidelity is the kind of amplifier that you're going to use on the output of your circuit QED system uh, in order to process the information in this readout pulse. Uh, in particular, any amplifier is going to add some noise and, and therefore affect the standard deviation of these distributions. And as that becomes larger, you have more infidelity. And so we really have a premium on, on, on making using an amplifier that adds the minimum amount of noise. Uh, so if there are just any beginners in the audience, I just want to remind you all, uh, what does an amplifier do? Uh, an amplifier is an electrical circuit that takes from input signal and provides an amplified copy of that on its output uh, and therefore provides power gain. Uh, but of course, it, if there is any noise associated with your input as well, that noise is also amplified on the output. Right? Uh, there is this fundamental property of all amplifiers is that it always grades SNR because it always adds some extra noise on the output. Uh, and that sounds a little bit counterintuitive because in principle, you are using an amplifier to get the best SNR. And uh, why? so why would you use an amplifier if it always adds noise? Uh, the reason is that you're always going to take this amplified signal and added noise and actually record it in some following electronics, some oscilloscope or digitizer in a computer, for instance. And that associate, that detector is going to have some noise associated with it. And so the role of the amplifier is really to provide power gain such that you can really uh, make the detector noise inconsequential. Uh, and this happens even though you have to add some extra noise to the input signal. So this automatically comes up uh, with a concept that we can call efficiency, which is how small can we really make this extra SNR degradation how can we minimize the price we have to pay such that we can you know, get an SNR as close as possible to the SNR from in our input, available to our input, right? So that essentially says, can we make amplifiers with the minimum possible added noise? This concept of the minimum added noise of a microwave amplifier or any type of amplifier is what's called the quantum limit and is expressed in photon number units as saying that uh, a quantum limited amplifier adds half a photon of noise, and any real amplifier is going to, in general, add slightly more or much more than half a photon of noise, depending on how it's constructed. 
All right, so uh, this is uh, just to give you a sense of uh, what happens when the amplifier adds noise. Essentially, these distributions that were sort of uh, reflecting the noise on the input side get increased due to the added noise of the amplifier. And any inefficiency in the amplification means that this uh, the standard deviation of these distributions is going to be greater than whatever corresponds to the quantum limit. Uh, if you buy a off-the-shelf semiconductor hemp amplifier commercially available, you will find that the typical added noise of, a, of this type of amplifier is roughly about 20 photons at these frequencies. Uh, and sort of the key uh, advance that the field of superconducting qubits has made very broadly now over the last uh, 10, 20 years is to be able to build these, uh, what I'm going to talk about, Josephson parametric amplifiers that essentially approach the quantum limit. So typically on the order of a one photon of added noise, where the quantum limit is half a photon. And so that means that these distribution functions are as narrow as they can be. Uh, and therefore, the fidelity is uh, goes up, and it, this is you know the key uh, uh, object that we really needed over the last let's say ten years to really achieve this very high fidelity readout of uh, uh, qubits with uh, ninety nine percent fidelity in a few hundred nanoseconds, and also extremely non demolition in nature. All right, so uh, uh, I hope. That gives you a general sense of uh, why JPAs are interesting. Uh, and so now I'm going to uh, talk specifically about a particular type of uh, Josephson param, which I call the snail parametric amplifier, and, and describe uh, that in more detail. Uh, so uh, I have used this word parametric, this phrase parametric amplifier now a few times. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, it's, a, it's based on a physical principle that all of us have experienced back in uh, childhood days when you play on a swing. Uh, you know that if you uh, move your body in sort of a periodic fashion, you can actually amplify the amplitude of the uh, oscillation. And what essentially you're doing is you're changing a parameter of this oscillator, which is the moment of inertia in this case, in a periodic fashion in order to amplify the, the motion. So, so that's the basic phenomenon. Uh, and associated with this parametric amplifier phenomenon, uh, there will always be two uh, factors that you should uh, pay attention to. Uh, the first factor is that there will, there will always be some energy source for the amplifier uh, that in order to actually increase the energy in, inside the oscillation. Um, and that's what we call the pump. Uh, in this case, in this uh, example, basically the work that the child is doing against the centrifugal force to sit, sit up and stand down, uh, sorry, stand up and sit down, uh, is, is, is what is the pump. Uh, and the other uh, feature of any paramp is that you need a nonlinear resonator or some kind of nonlinearity in, in the resonator. In this example, the fact that the restoring force is going as sine theta and not just theta is, is what is crucial. Uh, okay, so the world of uh, Josephson paramps in, on electrical circuits is quite uh, established. Uh, there is even now review articles which characterize and classify the various types of JPAs that many groups have built. Uh, and this is just a classification of just the sort of resonant parametric amplifiers that are based on some resonance phenomenon. Uh, uh, and in this classification, you can look at it in terms of the number of ports. You can look at it on whether the number of modes in the device are overlapping in frequency, which is what we call degenerate, or have different frequencies, which we call non-degenerate. Uh, and you can also uh, classify based on the type of nonlinear interaction that is in, inside the amplifier. Uh, into what we call four wave and three wave. Uh, and I'll describe this in a little bit more soon. Uh, and I, this is a very rich field. And there are, in fact, of course, amplifiers like the traveling wave amplifiers that uh, many of you, I'm sure, are using, uh, which uh, is you know even outside this type of classification in some sense. Uh, there are DC biased amplifiers as well. Uh, and in all of these amplifiers, I'm going to focus on the ones made with Josephson junctions, but you can also use uh, the nonlinear property of a kinetic inductance of a superconductor to make these type of amplifiers. 
So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on sort of the simplest type of circuit, uh, a one port degenerate amplifier uh, realized either using four wave mixing or three wave mixing uh, and, and describe how we can construct these a little bit more. And, and I want to get a sense uh, to you to understand this and uh, sort of uh, some of the ideas that we show in terms of how we engineer these uh, uh, resonant paramps can also sort of transfer into other types of paramps like the traveling wave amplifier. Okay, so what is the challenge that we're really trying to solve in, when we design an amplifier? Uh, that sort of can be understood by just looking at this SNR equation. The overall signal to noise ratio depends on the you know, magnitude of the input signal, subtract any kind of loss in your measurement system. Uh, if you have a very good first amplifier in your measurement system, the effect of the losses later in the system can be reduced by just the gain of the amplifier, uh, of the first amplifier. Uh, in addition, on the denominator, you have the noise of the uh, coming in from the input, but you also have added noise from your first microwave amplifier, plus extra noise coming from other stages of amplification in your measurement electronics. Uh, and so uh, the gain of the first amplifier essentially allows you to beat down the extra noise that let's say the following amplifiers or your detector uh, uh, have right? in order to maximize the SNR. Okay, so uh, looking at this formula, you can see that essentially we want large gain to suppress the effect of these extra noise and losses. So typically we operate at about 20 dB of gain. Uh, we want uh, nearly quantum limited added noise. So we want this added noise to be as small as possible, uh, as close to half a photon. And uh, these are sort of two fundamental properties, but in addition, practically for uh, using this in readout of let's say quantum processors, we want other properties. For instance, we want to be able to uh, handle as large an input signal as possible, such that we can measure uh, uh, many qubits in parallel. And we also potentially, this, since this function depends on frequency, we also want this function to hold over as large a bandwidth as possible, both in terms of the dynamic bandwidth of the amplifier, and also in some cases, how far we can tune the amplifier across some frequency range uh, as well. So these are you know, basic amplifier characteristics, but in addition, uh, there are sort of other practical issues that you may want to consider. Uh, some amplifiers may cause some kind of classical back action on the qubit that you're measuring, simply because the, the uh, signals that you're sending to the amplifier leak back in, uh, through into your qubit and cause some, uh, you know, uh, some back action on the qubit. Uh, you may care about a concept that we call the power efficiency. So I told you that we always supply some pump power to the device. Uh, you, may, uh, you may want that you minimize the amount of pump power that you're supplying in order to get a certain amplifier performance. In, in, so that's what we consider as an efficiency. Uh, and then in general, you may also just want uh, the simpler to fab and operate type of amplifier uh, as well. Right, so, uh, so as I said, I'm gonna talk about a specific type of amplifier that I call the snail parametric amplifier and, and show you how we can get many of these characteristics engineered. Um, so first, what is the snail? Uh, the snail uh, is a acronym that uh, represents this particular composite element, which consists of a loop with three Josephson junctions on one side and a single smaller Josephson junction on the other side. And this is an SEM micrograph showing you the location of the various junctions built using the sun standard aluminum Dolan bridge process. And uh, so uh, this device is sort of uh, turned out to be quite useful for many, many experiments. And so we gave it this uh, acronym SNAIL, standing for superconducting nonlinear asymmetric inductive element. As you know, in our field, we like to name uh, circuits of out of crustaceans and like the squid or the slug and and so we call this the snail to give it a nice name and we gave it a symbol and we're going to sort of keep using this symbol uh, in other uh, more complex circuits. Uh, okay, so why is this snail useful? Well, essentially, uh, you can understand uh, what it does by looking at the potential energy function, which looks like the following: the first term coming from the small junction and the second term coming from the three larger junctions. Uh, 
And uh, if you plot this potential energy function, uh, you can tailor expand it about a minimum and it has, it's gonna have a set bunch of terms. There's gonna be the sort of quadratic term as you expect. Uh, there is gonna be a cubic term uh, in the potential energy as a function of this phase coordinate phi across the junction. And in addition, there's gonna be a quartic term and potentially higher higher terms as well. Okay, so that's uh, that's these are basically the nonlinear terms and the potential energy function that we are going to use uh, in order to uh, show parametric amplification. Uh, so uh, this gives you an example of an optical micrograph of a typical snail parametric amplifier. Uh, so it's a lambda by two resonator with in the center embedded a, a array of uh, m snails where each snail is the uh, element I showed you before, and we can thread magnetic flux through that loop uh, and to control the properties of the device. We also couple the uh, one side of this resonator to an external a port by a coupling capacitor, which sets the line width of the resonator. And we will introduce the pump drive through another second port, which is weakly coupled to this resonator. And you can see that in the engineering and design of this device, there are many, many parameters like the inductance of the junctions and the ratio of the junction sizes, the number M of snails, the inductance of this linear resonator and the coupling capacitance. So all of that is set at the time of fabrication. We can also control the uh, flux through the device which uh, in situ. And so all of these parameters that we, we engineer, all of them basically control uh, in addition to the coupling kappa, the Hamiltonian of the device, which looks like the following. There's a linear harmonic oscillator term, omega a, a dagger a. There is this term associated with the cubic uh, nonlinearity of the potential energy. And then there's a third term associated with the quartic nonlinearity of the potential energy. And so uh, when we build an amplifier using a three-wave mixing process, uh, which I will describe soon, what we're essentially doing is we're going to use the first two terms of this Hamiltonian, and in particular this cubic uh, term. Uh, and the quartic term in the Hamiltonian is going to look like a parasitic term, which we will hopefully want to suppress as much as possible uh, so it doesn't affect the physics of how this amplifier behaves. All of these terms are actually functions of the external flux that we can tune in situ. So when we uh, cool down a representative SPA, and look at it, look at the parameters here as a function of flux, you can see uh, a generic device has a resonance frequency between seven, six and seven gigahertz with a line width of roughly 200 megahertz. And then the important cubic nonlinearity term G3 is typically around a megahertz. Uh, and then there is this quartic G4 nonlinearity, which we also call the Kerr nonlinearity. And you can see that uh, generically, it is at almost two to three orders of magnitude smaller. And so that's some amount of engineering in terms of the size of the uh, junctions and, and the number of junctions that have been chosen in order to make uh, make this really you know, three orders of magnitude smaller. And uh, in addition to the fact that it is uh, G4 is three orders of magnitude smaller, there is also this interesting feature that the snail has, which is that at a certain value of the flux, uh, the G4 actually goes through zero. Uh, and so you can really suppress the nonlinearity uh, at, at, at certain key operating points. Right, so, so that's the generic Hamiltonian of the device. Uh, and so now let me describe for you how you make this into a parametric amplifier. Uh, so this device basically looks like a resonance uh, at some frequency omega a with a line with kappa. Um, in order to make it behave as an amplifier, you apply a pump uh, at roughly twice the resonance frequency and with an amplitude alpha p. In the presence of this pump, this G3 nonlinear cubic term uh, gets transformed such that the effective Hamiltonian of the device has this G a square plus a dagger square factor, which looks like basically that photons are being created or destroyed in pairs. And the uh, prefactor in front of this uh, uh, operator uh, basically depends on the G3 nonlinearity, which is set by fab and the magnetic flux. 
as well as by the pump amplitude alpha p. All right, so in the presence of this uh, type of interaction, if we now apply a small signal to the input port, then that six small signal stimulates via this term uh, the destruction of a pump photon into a pair of photons. Uh, one of those photons is going to be at the signal frequency and it's going to come out of the device. And the second photon is going to be at a different frequency that we call the idler. And due to energy conservation, we need that the sum of the frequencies of the signal and idler photon add up to the pump photon. And this response is going to be essentially centered at half the pump frequency over some uh, bandwidth that is dependent on the gain as well. Uh, and, and in general, has to be within roughly a line width of the center of the microwave resonance given by this factor delta. Okay, so uh, you can see that essentially because a weak signal stimulates many more photons to come back out of the device at the signal frequency, this uh, device uh, under the action of the pump behaves like a para parametric amplifier. And so you can look at what is the gain of the device as a function of the uh, interaction term G, which you can control with the pump strength. And you see that when you make the denominator here close to zero, you can basically have a very large gain. Uh, and uh, in practice, you see on the right, an example of the gain curves measured on these devices showing that as you increase the pump power, indeed you can get large gain, even as high as uh, 40 dB in, in, in in some cases. All right, so that's the basic operation of uh, a three-wave mixing degenerate parametric amplifier. But uh, uh, now we should understand, you know, what are things that break in this uh, in this uh, physical system. In particular, this uh, presentation I gave you so far cannot be true for arbitrarily large signal powers. Right, just a simple energy conservation uh, would tell you that you are supplying a fixed amount of pump uh, energy. Uh, and uh, as you increase the input signal power, you're asking the amplifier to produce more and more uh, photons at the signal frequency on its output. And there has to be some limit because the, there is only certain amount of photons coming in at the pump frequency. Right? So this, this, uh, this behavior cannot hold for arbitrary large signal powers. And that's the phenomenon that we call gain compression. Uh, which is typically seen as, as you increase the input signal power, the gain basically falls. And we characterize this by a, a, a factor that we call the compression power, P1 dB, which says what is the input signal power at which the gain falls by a dB. And so in typical resonant paramps, this number is roughly minus 130 to minus 120 dBm. Uh, and even the best reported values uh, were you know, around minus 110 dBm before we did this work without a lot of understanding about what really controls that number. Uh, but this is important because the typical readout power we use when we measure superconducting qubits is also in the same range. And so the amplifier is sort of fundamentally limiting how many qubits you can measure at the same time. Uh, so that's why it's important to understand this phenomenon. Uh, we uh, oh, is, ha, do understand what, what controls it, Essentially, it's this G4 nonlinearity that I described earlier, this uh, curve nonlinearity. Uh, what the curve nonlinearity does is that it takes one of these uh, uh, terms, the detuning term in the gain function, and adds an extra term, which we call the stock shift, which is essentially a frequency shift of the resonance as a function of the input signal power due to the presence of this G4 nonlinearity. And so you can write out uh, what is the compression power under this model, and you find that is it is inversely proportional to the uh, fourth order nonlinearity and directly proportional to the line width. Uh, so uh, what we did uh, uh, in the last few years while I was at Yale was to really systematically study uh, how we can engineer these uh, nonlinearity and line width across many devices to improve the compression power. Uh, and so, uh, in this plot, I'm showing you the compression power as function of the operating frequency of the device. Uh, marked over here is a typical resonant paramp, uh, the minus 120 to minus 130 dBm number I told you earlier from before these types of optimizations were done. Um, 
There is a device over here in blue, which roughly speaking is a very similar design and so matches that type of compression power. And then across three generations of devices with increasing uh, line width and uh, much lower nonlinearity, we can show that we actually improve the compression power by almost two orders of magnitude. Uh, and then the last device I want to point out here is particularly special because it really showed uh, this key feature that happens when the uh, fourth order nonlinearity goes to zero, that you see this sort of peak in the uh, compression when the fourth order nonlinearity really goes to zero. And so that's sort of really uh, showing you that uh, uh, the snail is a very useful uh, element uh, allowing you to engineer compre uh, higher compression power. So of course, in this particular device, uh, this uh, peak was exactly at one frequency, uh, but the overall range over which this peak could potentially occur really depends on the line width of the device. And if you do some more engineering, microwave engineering in terms of the impedance the device sees on its input, essentially uh, you can in principle at least increase the range over which this larger compression power is, is visible. And there has been further work in, in the Hattridge group at uh, Pittsburgh in the last year or so, indeed in showing similar type of devices. All right, so that's sort of uh, what uh, we had uh, when I started the group here at UT Austin. And so in the rest of the talk, I want to tell you about some work that we are doing along these lines with SPAs at, at Austin. Uh, and the first sort of thing that we are studying on these uh, snail paramps is to understand what type of squeeze state can we really generate with these uh, paramps. Uh, so just to remind you, uh, the squeeze state is a, is a very useful primitive uh, state uh, that is useful for many, many things. Uh, what is a squeeze state? It's the idea that uh, in the output of a degenerate parametric amplifier right at the center frequency of that gain, uh, if you look at the response on the IQ in phase quadrature plane, you will find that on along one quadrature, the noise has been squeezed below the sort of vacuum noise level of uh, one half. Uh, while uh, due to the uncertainty principle, the overall area of this distribution has to be conserved. And so in the other direction, the noise has been expanded uh, correspondingly. And if you really are squeezing a, qu a quantum noise vacuum state, then the so overall area is going to basically be one quarter. OK, so this type of squeeze state is, is a very useful state. It's been used, in fact, uh, in Irfan's group a while ago for qubit readout and improving sensitivity. It's been used in magnetic resonance measurements, axion detection, and as a primitive for continuous variable quantum computing. And the sort of real figure of merit in terms of be, this state being useful when we generate it is how much are we able to reduce the noise along the squeeze quadrature below the quantum noise level. And sort of the record that uh, people have done uh, is roughly about 10 dB uh, in sort of four wave mixing traveling wave amplifiers or resonant parametric amplifiers. Um, and so the question is sort of what controls this uh, squeezing level? Uh, and what has been known for now a few years, theoretically at least, is that uh, the four-way mixing nonlinearity itself limits the level of squeezing because it distorts the amplifier output. So in this sort of theory plot taken from this paper, you can see that if you start with a four-way mixing amplifier and then increase the amount of nonlinearity, you find that the squeeze state that you're creating gets distorted very quickly, uh, even for moderate nonlinearity. Uh, but if you start with a three-wave mixing amplifier, in which case the four-wave curve term is a, is, a paras uh, is a small term, then you can get a larger squeeze state. Uh, and in principle, uh, if you sub the, the more you're able to suppress the curve nonlinearity, the, the better uh, squeezing you can get. And so the question we are investigating is, can squeezing really be improved in the SPA when it's operated at the curve-free point? Uh, there's been only one other uh, measurement along these lines in this traveling wave amplifier using uh, uh, snails. Uh, but even in there, the, the record squeezing they got was roughly 3 dB, and we are trying to understand if we can do better. So this is still uh, very preliminary over the last uh, few months in, in the lab. 
uh, we are able to show that we can indeed measure the squeeze states on the output of the param. Uh, this is showing you an example of as you increase the pump amplitude, you indeed see a squeeze state. Uh, you can uh, plot the distributions in along the various quadratures, and uh, you can see that if you start without the pump on, you get a certain Gaussian distribution. And when you have the pump on, uh, in the anti-squeeze quadrature, that is the I prime quadrature, you see indeed that this, the variance goes up. Uh, in the squeeze quadrature, which is the red line, uh, it's not very clear from this plot that the variance actually is reduced. Uh, but if you sort of really uh, rotate the angle and analyze it systematically, you indeed find that the variance in the squeeze quadrature has gone down below the variance with the pump off. Yeah, and so this is what we would call the squeezing level, which is the ratio in dB of the variance when the pump is on versus off. And so now we want to try to maximize the squeezing. Uh, and uh, that's what is shown here as a function of the pump amplitude. Sort of the key challenge here is how do we really calibrate for any inefficiency in the rest of the measurement system? So what we have is, a, is, a, is our squeezer SPA. We have vacuum noise on the input. It goes to the SPA and comes out like a squeeze state. But then when we actually record it, we have the rest of the measurement electronics, which has some inefficiency, which can be understood in terms of the noise temperature of the system. Uh, and so uh, the game that uh, the community in general plays is to adjust for the measured squeezing level in terms of the known, hopefully well-calibrated uh, efficiency to account for the actual squeezing level as adjusted. Uh, and so this data shows you some examples of the squeezing we measure. The blue trace is sort of the raw trace without any following SPA. We just have using a hemp amplifier to do the measurement. And so that's the most inefficient measurement system, just the raw squeezing level. Uh, the orange trace shows you the squeezing level in the presence of a following SPA here, which potentially improves the efficiency of the system. But we do see that this, uh, at some point, the squeezing sort of turns around because the uh, the following SPA itself has a compression phenomenon, and so it distorts the output. So we are not able to actually measure very high degree of squeezing you, when we use the following SPA because of its compression power. Well, so those are the raw traces. In terms of adjusting, you can sort of adjust, assuming that what would happen if the blue trace were and the, uh, and the following SPA were not compressing. And, and so that's sort of the green trace, which gives you roughly about a dB of squeezing at maximum. Uh, and if you are just assuming that the hemp is really giving you uh, a six Kelvin noise temperature according to its data sheet, that's the red trace and in, which comes down to around four dB. So overall, we imagine that essentially the, what the SPA is producing is somewhere between one to four dB of squeezing at this point in, in our experiment. Okay, so that's certainly a preliminary study. We have not uh, exhausted this at all. Uh, we, of course, want to calibrate this efficiency better using uh, some kind of uh, calibrated noise source. Uh, uh, and we want to then study the squeezing as a function of various parameters. In particular, we have not, this is taken at a generic operating point, and we want to measure it at the curve free point where the this uh, G4 nonlinearity goes to zero. And another thing sort of I, I, I'm interested in conceptualizing is an experiment where instead of using a sort of traditional uh, measurement chain, uh, we measure squeezing using uh, a, a system consisting of a superconducting qubit. Uh, we know, for instance, from work uh, from a while ago at Berkeley that you can look at the dephasing of a qubit in the presence of noise associated uh, coming from a squeezer. Uh, and, and use that to characterize the level of squeezing. So that might be an interesting experiment to do as well. All right, so uh, that's sort of all I had to say about the snail parametric amplifier. And now I'm sort of gonna shift gears to a second type of parametric amplifier. Now, instead of being based using sort of traditional junctions, rather with this sort of more newer type of uh, junction technology. Okay, so uh, this whole work is motivated by a question, which is, uh, is there an alternative to the sort of aluminum aluminum oxide SIS-Jolson junction that we all use, 
uh, you know, very, very uh, broadly in our quantum circuits. And, you know, is there something that is potentially more scalable in the future as we think about large scale systems? Uh, so with the SIS, aluminum oxide Joseph's junction, the really nice thing is that there is really, as far as we can tell, very little dissipation in this element. Uh, but the sort of drawback is that uh, the cosine phi type of uh, potential energy function means that there are many higher order nonlinearity terms which are you know, substantial. And, and we use them for many uh, of our the physics of our devices, but we would, you know, as much as possible, not like to have these higher order nonlinearities if we didn't want them. So in uh, recent uh, years, there have been a new type of Josephson junction that's been uh, fabricated using sort of more traditional semiconductor-based uh, uh, fab methods, uh, uh, in particular using molecular beam epitaxy. And so this is a cartoon taken from one of these uh, recent papers of a uh, superconductor semiconductor heterostructure grown using MBE, where you have an indium arsenide quantum well in epitaxial contact with aluminum electrodes. And so this forms between the two aluminum electrodes a so-called super semi super Josephson junction. You can have Cooper pair tunneling between the two aluminum electrodes via the indium arsenide quantum well. Uh, so this in this type of uh, junction intrinsically has a lower value for the nonlinearity parameters in the potential energy function, and that could be useful. Uh, but it has another feature, which is that it looks uh, you can really make it look a lot like a transistor because you can etch out the uh, aluminum and deposit an aluminum oxide barrier and then put a third aluminum gate electrode. And so it, the device essentially looks like a gate voltage tunable device where you're controlling the Josephson coupling between the two aluminum drain and source electrodes via the voltage applied to the gate, which controls the carrier density in the indium arsenide. And so these kind of heterostructures have been already used, these junctions in, in so-called gate-mon qubits. And so the question is, can we really build an amplifier with this type of heterostructure and, and show something like a quantum limited performance? So this uh, uh, here are some images of the type of device we can build our collaborate in our collaboration. We get from the group at NYU, this epitaxial heterostructure grown with MBE with these uh, dimensions shown, the key, one being the indium arsenide quantum well. Uh, here's a TEM, transmission electron microscope image of the device uh, uh, taken by them showing really the crucial sort of really epitaxial contact between the aluminum electrode and the indium gallium arsenide crystal. You can see that there is really a crystalline order over here. Uh, and then when we receive the heterostructure, we then go ahead and etch out a part of the epi epitaxial aluminum. Uh, we make a narrow gap, which is a few hundred nanometers or so. And then we deposit a, a gate oxide using atomic layer deposition, followed by a, another gate electrode, also aluminum. And so the overall device looks like the following, where uh, we have the source contact and the drain contact. Uh, we have a four terminal measurement. Uh, so we, we extend it out into two sets of contacts at each side. And then we have the narrow gap in the middle, which you can't see, which is overlapped by the gate aluminum electrode. So this is the type of device we build when we want to do just basic DC characterization. Uh, and so uh, since this is a new type of uh, junction, I should just make sure that uh, to show you that the basic DC characterization, uh, low frequency characterization of this device does make it look like a Josephson junction. So you can see that if you look at this, the DC IV properties, uh, you see the sharp change in the current as you at near zero voltage that is sort of uh, showing you some kind of uh, Josephson junction like behavior. And this, uh, this uh, change depends on the gate voltage uh, as you would expect. Uh, to characterize the critical current, we do a AC resistance measurement, and that's what's shown here. Uh, we're showing the AC resistance as a function of the bias current and the gate voltage. And you can see that, indeed, there's a large region where the resistance basically goes to zero, corresponding to the superconducting state of the device. Uh, if you take cuts at various gate voltages, you can see that, indeed, 
you have zero resistance up till some bias current, uh, DC bias current, at which point the device switches into some normal state resistance. Uh, we take this switching current as an estimate of the critical current, uh, and that critical current, uh, when we plot as a function of the gate voltage, we see phenomenologically some kind of square root dependence on the gate voltage. Okay, so this is showing you that indeed we can make these uh, gate voltage tunable Josephson junctions. Uh, and so now let's see if we can build quantum circuits with them, in particular a parametric amplifier. Uh, so this is an example of a, a, quant a microwave circuit where we take this gate voltage tunable junction, embed it into an LC oscillator like in our, uh, uh, like we do in paramps, and then connect it to a, a microwave port into through which we can apply input signals and look at the reflected response. Okay, so that's the circuit. We can now use this circuit in, in various modes. If we apply our pump tone directly to the same uh, input signal port, uh, we are essentially doing four-way mixing using the fourth order nonlinearity of this uh, junction. Uh, and that's sort of what is shown roughly over here. Uh, it's a very, the very sort of more traditional way that JPAs are used. Um, and then if we instead apply the pump to the gate port, we are basically modulating the uh, inductance of the device. Uh, if we do that at roughly the twice the resonance frequency, then we are basically doing three-way mixing. And so a small input signal gets reflected with gain exactly like how it does in the snail parametric amplifier I described. So uh, uh, you know we have basically two modes of operating this uh, device. Uh, in in today's talk, we're going to sort of focus on this four-way mixing behavior. But in principle, the three-way mixing process is also possible. Uh, uh, the device we actually built has a slightly more involved microwave design, where we put some impedance transformers on the input side with different uh, impedances. The lengths set the frequency. That was designed to be around eight megahertz with a uh, eight gigahertz, sorry, with a with a line width of hundred megahertz. And the measured device that I'm going to show you had uh, uh, measured parameters close enough to to what was designed. Uh, here's a optical image of the device showing you the input port, the two impedance transformers, the two sections of transmission line with uh, different resist uh, impedances, and then right at the end is the Josephson junction, the JJ FET, with its gate electrode. If you zoom in, you see essentially in the dark black uh, is the overlapping gate on top of the uh, Josephson junction, where you know under that gate you have the same kind of gap in the epitaxial aluminum, uh, which defines the junction. And so the sort of cross section of this is exactly like the cross section I showed you earlier. Okay, so with that uh, type of device, now we can study the properties. Uh, we can in particular look at the nonlinear response at, of this device at, at zero gate voltage, and we see sort of the familiar looking response that is very characteristic of a four-way mixing Josephson amplifier. Uh, so the resonance frequency shifts down as you increase the probe power, uh, and at some high enough probe power, uh, it becomes very sharp and bifurcates. Uh, and so uh, if you want to uh, make a parametric amplifier using this device, it's well known that you have to apply a pump uh, to the device close to this bifurcation power. Um, and so that's what we do next. We, we uh, study how this behaves as a four-wave mixing parametric amplifier. And indeed, you see that you get uh, a reflected gain when you have the pump on versus off. Uh, uh, in the plot on the right, we are showing you the gain, uh, the maximum gain as a function of the pump frequency and power. And this sort of dependence is very characteristic of the sort of uh, four-way mixing uh, Josephson parametric amplifier, like the ones you would build with traditional aluminum Josephson junctions. Uh, the graph on the bottom shows you the various gain curves as a function of the probe frequency uh, at different pump powers. Uh, and then, you know, we can now study other types of characteristics like the compression power that I described earlier. 
So in this amplifier, the compression power turns out to be roughly already minus 120 dBm in just sort of a first device without any particular uh, care of uh, trying to engineer it uh, in, in, in some sense. I believe that this uh, compression power, uh, higher compression power uh, than sort of traditional aluminum oxide based junction paramps indicates that the nonlinearity is indeed lower with these uh, JJ fetch, uh, but that's something that we want to study more uh, systematically now. Uh, we can change the gate voltage and, and tune the gain uh, across some range in frequency. Uh, and uh, we can also look at the noise coming out of the device. Uh, and we see, as expected in a paramp, excess noise uh, coming out of the device because of the added noise of the amplifier centered on where we have gain. Uh, and, and the rough value of about 12 dB noise over the hemp noise indicates to us that we are dealing with a system that is sort of nearly quantum limited. So further work along these lines to improve these devices is essentially to really uh, characterize the curved nonlinearity in these devices and show whether it's indeed uh, smaller than the corresponding curved nonlinearity in, in a aluminum oxide based, aluminum aluminum oxide based junction. Uh, and also to uh, study uh, this uh, 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 paramp in the three wave mixing mode and then further optimize, characterize the, characterize the various properties and optimize for, for them. All right, uh, with that, I think I'd like to conclude. I hope I've given you a sense of uh, what JPAs are and how they are useful for information, quantum information mm -hmm. processing talked about the snail paramp and how we optimized it for compression power and how we're studying squeezing coming out of these amplifiers. And then in the last part about the super semi heterostructure based amplifiers. Well, thank you for a very thank interesting you. talk. That new amplifier is cool, interesting. Uh, are there any questions and comments from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Hi. Thanks for the very nice talk. Sure. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the, the losses in this uh, uh, heterostructure from yeah. the oxide and maybe even from the, the, the semiconductor layers. I imagine there'll be like piezoelectric losses or so. Uh, did, did you guys study this or are the loss so properly? We have not done, we have not focused on that necessarily. So we've not done systematic studies, but uh, it is indeed known that the indium phosphide substrate has losses. Uh, and so, for instance, the, the nice thing about microwave amplifiers is that we are not, because we are very well coupled to the external world, the external port, we are not as sensitive to intrinsic uh, losses in the device as, for instance, a qubit type of uh, device would be. So in this device, the intrinsic uh, line width was something like 10 megahertz, and we were uh, with the ext external coupling was 50 megahertz, could have been made larger. Um, so in terms of making the losses better, there are ways. Uh, we are just doing a blanket ALD deposition. So that, of course, uh, means that most of our microwave circuits are covered with potentially lossy oxide, and, and that could be done in a, in a better way. Uh, there are more challenging ideas that are more on the uh, forte of the MBE growers, which is, can you really build this type of heterostructure on a, on a known good semiconductor like silicon, for instance, or sapphire, uh, or perhaps uh, maybe if it's not done directly, can you do some kind of heterogeneous thing where you grow it on one substrate and then transfer it over onto another substrate, like the kinds that people do with 2D materials. So uh, if these devices show promise in some respects and, and loss is the only issue, it, it could potentially, you know, uh, catalyze a, a more effort along those lines. You know, essentially this is a semiconducting platform like industry, so there is some scaling aspect there. Mm -hmm. I had one I more question. question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess in terms of MB quality, three fives should be really, really good or two sixes would be very good. Um, yes. But I think what people found is that, you know, there are these piezoelectric losses, which uh, limit you, which is kind of fundamental. 
when right. you're working. So the question I think is how much of the microwave mode really participates in the uh, in the dielectric layers versus in known good things like semi silicon, for instance. So mm -hmm. if you could really reduce the footprints. So right now, the way we've made the device, most of this microwave mode is on top of the 3.5 and therefore is limited by whatever piezoelectric loss there is in the 3.5. But there's nothing that forces us to build it that way. That is just easy to fab right now. Uh, but you could imagine removing most of these 3.5s you may be left with the indium phosphide substrate and limited by that, which I agree would have piezoelectric uh, loss. And so that's why I was saying, if you could in principle, take all of this and grow it on silicon or transfer mm -hmm. it to silicon, then all of this microwave structure could be on silicon and therefore not as lost. And you would only have this tiny region of basically 100 nanometers by a couple microns where there would be the piezoelectric material. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? I have one more if there's uh, no one. I have a question. Okay, good. Go ahead. Um, first, uh, I'm not sure if my audio is good. So okay, otherwise, yeah. I can maybe tab it. Okay, sounds good. So I wanted to ask about the carefree uh, point when uh, tuning the snail amplifier. Uh, you said um, it can give you a boost in terms of the compression power, but yes. I was uh, also thinking about the gain because in the ideal case, the, the gain really shoots up. Um, so I was wondering how operating close to that point would affect the, the gain of the device and what would be the limiting factor to, to the gain. Uh, so maybe uh, this is maybe didn't get across. All of these points that I have plotted over here were all taken at 20 dB gain. So essentially the device allows you to get pretty much arbitrary gain at any given operating frequency, you know, somewhere between zero dB up to 40 dB. But because we always operate our amplifiers at 20 dB gain because of the consideration of the uh, added noise and, and that I described earlier, we, we basically characterize compression power at 20 dB gain. So all of these points are at 20 dB gain. Does that answer your question? Or maybe you have a follow-up? Uh, I think it does. Be, I mean, the audio cut out a little bit, but you said you can operate at, at higher uh, gains. Can, can you explain that, please? Yeah, so, so you can operate at higher gains, but when we are doing a compression power characterization, we always fix the gain at a, at a fixed value. And that is independent of whether we are at the curve-free point or not. So the curve-free point is chosen by you know, changing the magnetic flux. But then once we've identified the magnetic flux, we can vary the pump amplitude such that we are having 20 dB of gain. Uh, and so all of these points are taken for 20 dB of gain. And, and what we are showing you is that by careful choice of the pump frequency and the magnetic flux, you can see the effect of the nonlinearity going to zero. I see. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions? You had one, Alp. Yeah. So I guess uh, if I kind of think about these uh, new uh, field effect, uh, you know, Josephson junctions, I guess the weaker nonlinearity is kind of good for power handling. Uh, you have voltage tunability. Is that what distinguishes from, like, let's say, a kinetic in inductance-based nonlinearity, which can also be weak? Is is the voltage tunability the main? Uh, I would say the voltage tunability is is probably in the short term one of the main uh, advantages. Uh, the kinetic inductance paramps, at least the ones with these uh, niobium trinitrite style superconductors typically require, because of the even weaker nonlinearity, typically require much more pump power. Uh, and mm -hmm. so the efficiency may not be as good. So there, it's uh, with these amplifiers, there are many factors that you're sort of simultaneously trying to optimize for. And so it's uh, you can always find one which is good on one metric. But if you mm -hmm. want to get everything good, then this type of junction, which is not quite as 
uh, it, it is not quite as linear as a kinetic inductance, but not quite as nonlinear as a SIS junction may be a sweet spot. We really have to try it and see. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, that's have a quick question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I think I found your discussion of the um, the effects of these higher order nonlinear is very fascinating, and I think the the uh, amplifier compression is an uh, interesting application. Could you touch on maybe? If you have other applications in mind to being able to you know, suppress or control these higher order nonlinearities? Oh, yeah. So, uh, the reason that this snail sort of evolved, at least in the Yale group, far beyond its application in, in amplifiers, is that the first thing we realized is that when you want to, let's say, couple two microwave cavities, high, high, high Q microwave cavities, and let's say do beam splitter type of gates between cavities or any kind of parametric gate between even qubits, uh, you typically are trying to use some kind of mixing process. Uh, traditionally, everyone did it with four-way mixing because you know, the sort of single junctions were sort of standard uh, in the transmon. But if you do it with three-way mixing, you really suppress, you can really suppress this fourth order nonlinearity, which is a parasite, parasite when you're trying to do any sort of two mode gate. Uh, and, and, and so, in fact, even more recently, since I left at Yale, many experiments use the snail not as a, not in their amplifier, but rather as couplers between modes uh, and, and, and a way to turn on and off a, an, a, an interaction between either qubits or IQ cavities uh, and, and get a very pure interaction without the extra nonlinearity, higher order nonlinearity effects. Does that answer your question? Okay. So we're a little bit five minutes over time. So let's thank Shyam again. Thank you very much, Shyam. And thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>